housing market is, as you mentioned, is white hot in terms of buying a home. Uh, some areas, the rental market is also closed up, and it's very difficult to uh, find a rental. And so rental prices are going up as fast as real estate prices are, which there should be a correlation between the two. That makes sense. Um, so uh, uh, you have done a wonderful job saving money, sir. Well done. How's it going YouTube today I'm, we're going to be doing an educational video on something called a REIT so REIT stands for real estate investment trust and essentially what they are are these entities that allow retail investors to own pieces of large real estate commercial properties residential properties and first I want to go over with everyone well what are the kinds of REITs that exist and what are some of the uh, advantages or disadvantages of each individual type. Now, the first one that I would like to go over is the equity REIT here on the left-hand side. So we can see <clears throat> equity, REITs, equity REITs actually make up a, the largest percentage of the overall sector, and they basically earn their uh, income from property rents and they own the underlying asset while well, compared to mortgage REITs, which actually are the minority of the market, they earn interest revenue off of debt. So the point of mortgage REITs essentially are uh, sources of income and the purpose of an equity REIT is growth and income because you get that, um, that uh, added uh, benefit from, um, from inflation, so inflation hedging, things like that. And basically with a uh, equity REIT, you're going to see lower starting dividend yields. However, with the expectation that over time, you're going to get higher income down the road. So if you can see here, the 20 year annualized return for equity REITs is actually a lot higher than that of the uh, mortgage REITs. And that's to be expected, especially when you consider that the uh, uh, interest rates have been declining over the years. So that has been a tailwind for equity REITs and a headwind for mortgage REITs. Now, if that were to change at some time in the future, this could change drastically the nature of the industry and the sector as a whole. But that's something to note going forward that um, REITs in general are actually heavily correlated to interest rate fluctuations for a variety of reasons. It's also because they compete uh, with uh, fixed income assets. So a lot of people who otherwise would be investing in fixed income assets are instead looking for other sources of income that are quote unquote more stable. And REITs have been viewed as one of these things. So over the past 40 years, actually, equity REITs have had some huge tailwinds from declining interest rates in the 1980s up until now. And there's actually, it's a multi-layered cake, like we always say here. Uh, so there's more reasons as to why equity REITs have also gone up, you know, in, in general, they, they tend to follow the uh, health of the economy as well. So because it's dependent on whether the tenants are able to pay greater sums of rent. So again, what I wanna highlight here is the uh, usage of leverage right here. So uh, mortgage REITs use very high leverage and they make profit on the delta between what they're able to borrow and what they're able to lend out. And equity REITs make money on the delta between the cap rates and the money they're able to borrow. So I prefer personally to stay on the equity, equity REIT side rather than the mortgage REIT side. And then something I want to share with everyone is the um, different kinds of reasons or actually tax strategies that I implement personally when doing uh, REIT investing or investing in REITs. I personally put my REITs into my Roth IRA. And right here in front of you is some of the advantages of a Roth IRA. However, I would consult a licensed professional to advise you with these things who knows your specific circumstance. This video cannot serve as financial advice. Simply just by uh, talking to your uh, financial advisor or your uh, CPA, 
they can better understand your tax needs and what would benefit you in your current circumstance. But for me personally, that's kind of what I do. If I were to hold a REIT, which I do hold some, uh, and I'll, we'll talk about my position uh, today, it's held in a tax advantage account. And there is a reason for that. So if we go over, for example, why uh, the, there is an issue with something called double taxation. Double taxation can be experienced by regular corporations. So when I get a, when the, the company uh, makes income, it pays taxes on the corporate side. And when I get the money here at the shareholder side, I get taxed again. So if you think about it, if I'm on the highest tax bracket, the corporation will pay 21% right here. And then I over here on the shareholder side will pay a maximum of 20%. Add those together, it's 41%. So there's a 41% tax rate total when you add the two together. Now REITs, REITs do not pay taxes on the corporate level. Instead, they only pass the taxes onto the shareholder level and they're taxed as ordinary income. And that's kind of a very basic uh, understanding of that. There's a little more nuance to that because sometimes it can be returns of capital, but for the sake of it, most of the time, the dividends are just ordinary income. So it actually adds to that taxable income level. And so I prefer to hold them in my retirement accounts. That way they do, are not taxed as ordinary income. And in fact, what happens is I don't incur taxes on the corporate level, nor on the shareholder level. So it, it is actually highly tax advantageous, in my personal opinion, for my circumstance to hold REITs in a retirement account. Now, something that you need to consider with REITs is some of the um, accounting differences. So the one I will be using today as an example is Realty Income Delaware. Now with Realty Income here, let's just go for the purpose of this example. Uh, let's do a 10% discount rate. Let's, we're going to be issuing some shares and I'll actually go over that in a bit. Uh, they're issuing a lot more shares now because they're acquiring another REIT. Uh, so I will actually average that out to about uh, let's say 4%. I think 4% is, oh, that's the wrong one. And then 4% there. And then let's assume some growth targets. So this will be a conservatively growing company. So let's go between 1% and 5%. Oh, and I accidentally put a buyback. They're not going to be buy doing buybacks. They're going to be doing dilutions. So uh, let's 2, 3, four and five. Okay, so I'm not including reinvested dividends. Um, in fact, I'm uh, including, I'm saying that the uh, dividends I'm just going to keep and then I'm going to just go off of the business itself. If I were to include the reinvestment of dividends, I would actually have a, uh, a good effect on the buybacks or the share dilution because I'll be adding to my share count over time. Uh, but I can, I think this is reasonable given the business's history. So let's actually increase this discount rate. And now you can see at a 50% margin of safety to the market average return, uh, we can see what prices we would need to buy it at. Now, I personally hold realty income in my personal uh, retirement portfolio, and I've had, had it for at least three years now. Uh, so I have it at a lower cost basis than what would someone would be buying today. But that being said, I am not really selling it at this moment. I'm sort of just reinvesting the dividends. But the purpose of this video is to discuss what REITs are and some of the little nuances that may exist with REITs. So if you can see here, I indicated to the model that this is a REIT. So basically what this means is we're going to be calculating things a little differently. So on the back end of the model, what it's doing is it's grabbing something called AFFO and FFO. AFFO is essentially adjusted funds from operations, and FFO is funds from operations. I prefer to use FFO as a, I believe it is a more conservative measure. Uh, AFFO tends to uh, make some adjustments to, uh, in the idea is to smooth some things out. But for the purpose of this, I typically like to use um, AFFO. That's, uh, sorry, FFO. It's up to you on whether or not you want to choose one or the other. Um, it just depends on the person or, or in that individual's uh, requirements. So some other things, if we look at some key ratios, some of the key ratios might be a little different. You might notice that the 
long-term debt ratios don't actually look that bad. And that's because yes, a lot of the assets are backed by real estate. Ignore the uh, liquidity ratios. Those are because the uh, accounting language is a little different. So for the cash on the balance sheet, the model is not picking it up. And the gross profit margin, obviously it's gonna be zero because they're not selling a product. And we see the operating margins. Do you wanna see those kind of high? So I'm gonna add a little bit of more context to this. Realty income is considered to be a triple net lease uh, entity. So what that means is they have these tenants here. So these are their top 20 uh, tenants or their top tenants. And um, what, what basically these do is they sign triple net lease agreements, meaning that they are in charge of the property and realty income doesn't have to handle anything to do with the property itself. They just own the property and collect the rent checks. So if I were to, for example, we'll come back to this. I just want to make a quick point on the... Um, on the uh, uh, employee count, the employee count, I think Seeking Alpha shares this information uh, right here is 209. So there's 209 employees at this business that has a market cap of 25 billion. So that's almost like a really small office in a very large enterprise. And the reason for that is again, going back to the actual structure of the business and how they operate is a triple net lease arrangement. So they don't need a lot of overhead in order to maintain their pro uh, portfolio. While instead, what they do is they simply just own the property and collect the rent checks. And these tenants will take care of the property under certain uh, arrangements. And then on top of that, have uh, dependent on the agreement, have specific price increases built into the uh, contracts. So what does this mean with rent? So how does rent change uh, the dynamics of cost of capital and all that. So remember that in the model, I was saying that I expect realty income to dilute me over time. And that most of the time seems like a really bad uh, assumption, but that's not necessarily the case. That's kind of par of the course with uh, REITs because REITs are essentially issuing shares in order to acquire uh, new properties. So what you wanna make sure is that the cost of those shares are um, lower than what the cap rates are. So for example, well, what is the cost of a share? Well, a very basic understanding of that is to figure out, well, what is the dividend yield of the, of the uh, equity? And what we can see here is the dividend yield is 4.3%. So every time they issue a new share, in the present moment, if they continue to pay the current dividends, which is one of their actual um, uh, core you know, tenants of the business, um, they, by the way, their trademark is the monthly dividend company, they uh, are incurring a cost of 4.3% and think of that like an interest rate, but it's not technically an interest rate, but it's, an, it's kind of like an interest rate. So what you need to understand is they have to find properties in which the cap rates are greater than that cost. So if you can see here, I have pulled up the average cap rates dependent on uh, the types of uh, property type, property types between shops and centers. And the middle is the total average of the United States. And it's, it's around 6.63%. Um, of course, if you go into like larger cities, the cap rates get smaller. Uh, that just means that you're paying more for every square foot of property. So you, anyone living in the larger cities can kind of relate to this, how even your residential property is probably more expensive per square foot than a property out in the wilderness. Uh, and that, that makes sense because density implies uh, demand and this demand does affect price if supply doesn't catch up. So realty income needs to, it is crucial that they are able to constantly find properties that are yielding greater amounts than their cost of capital. Now, what is another way that REITs can uh, take on new properties is obviously through debt. So if you were to go buy a house, you could probably get a mortgage and then buy the property and you have an interest rate that's either fixed or hopefully not floating. And with that, that is your cost of capital. And if it's a rental, you're hopefully getting a higher rent 
than what you're paying for the property in terms of interest. So realty income looks for that mixture and a good CFO really wants to make sure that they're getting the best uh, uh, of both. So when their equity price gets too high, the dividend yield is going to get lower. And then that implies a lower cost. So they should be issuing more shares because it's easier as long as you're getting a, a, a delta, meaning the difference between the cap rate and the um, dividend yield, you're, you're actually providing value to shareholders. So going to like the macro, if there was someone who would say, okay, well, this sounds all well and good. And I believe uh, Realty Income, they, they advertise it on their, on their website. Uh, and someone's going to see this. They've averaged out 15.3% annualized rate of return, which is significantly surpassed the market, that market average rate of return over, over the time it's been public. Why wouldn't I just put all my money in REITs? Or if not, maybe uh, just this REIT. Well, the answer is because you would be highly correlating yourself to a specific macro risk, and that macro risk is interest rate risk. So if you are heavily exposed to this asset class, you have to realize that fluctuations in the interest rate environment to the upside can have a negative impact on the share price and also operational risk because of remember what that does. Well, that can increase the cost of capital uh, that these REITs must use in order to acquire new properties. While it does make properties cheaper, it also makes that the current portfolios become cheaper. And the way we can understand this is um, basically the uh, if, if, if it costs people more to borrow, more likely than not, less people will borrow. If less people will borrow to buy properties, then there'll be less demand for those properties. And if there's less demand, but the same amount of supply or declining supply, then the prices will reflect that new uh, environment. So you gotta be cognizant that if we experience an increase in interest rates, and depending on how severe that is, it could adversely affect your REIT holdings. However, that's not to say that some can succeed. I think the, the best run, and I think I believe personally that Realty Income is one of the best run uh, REITs out there, these will succeed over the longer term. So that's why it's part of my portfolio. And that's not to say it should be part of your portfolio. The purpose of including it in this video is kind of to use it as an example. So some of the highlights I'll, I'll uh, highlight here from the video to remember the two different types of REIT, mortgage and equity REITs. What are the differences between each one? What are the assets each one holds? And the different ways one can profit. Personally, again, I hold my REITs in a retirement account, so I have tax advantages and no double taxation. In fact, no taxation down the whole entity structure. And I believe in that way, I'm actually getting the full benefit of those cash flows, and I'm reinvesting those dividends constantly as passive income flows in. And then on top of that, I want everyone to remember uh, uh, leading into that is the taxation of these entities is not at the corporate structure, but on the individual uh, basis. So you are going to be taxed as ordinary income for the most part. And another thing to remember is some of the uh, uh, restrictions that I will actually get into now. So these are some of the rules that govern the REITs. And all of these must be followed. This, this is where I'll have some closing thoughts. But to highlight the first rule, they must invest, you see, at least 75% in real estate, cash, or U.S. Treasury. So basically what this means is Apple cannot become a REIT. Uh, they must fall under real estate. And then 75% of gross income must be from rents. Again, Apple cannot be a REIT. Pay a minimum of 90% of taxable income. This is very uh, particular because... What I was saying before is I uh, normally use funds from operation or adjusted funds from operation, and that's very different from taxable income. The reason why that is, for everyone to understand, is that there is a difference between uh, the, the cash and the actual net income because of depreciation. So those of you who have experience in accounting, you know exactly where I'm talking about. But for those of you who don't, basically depreciation is a non-cash expense, meaning no dollars have left my pocket, right? But it's an expense that I'm recognizing and deducting that from my revenues. And so when it gets down to the bottom line, my net income is going to be lower because of that depreciation. Now, you might be saying, well, then that sounds like that's an unfair discount. That's an unfair deduction. Well, not necessarily because 
depreciation is real. It does actually occur in the property. So your, your home, every year that goes by, things break, things become older, or they're going to break soon. So you want to show that in some way, and that's done through depreciation. So depreciation is a real cost. Don't be mistaken that it's a fake cost or a phony cost that accountants made up. It is a real cost. And just to note that there will be a difference between the net income in the cash flows. And the cash flows for REITs is what you really want to pay attention to and make sure that those are increasing. And then what they have to do is pay a 90% amount of that taxable, taxable net income, which may be lower than the cash flows. So this is a good thing because maybe if let, let's say the cash flows are a dollar and the um and the um, uh, gap net income, or sorry, the taxable net income is 50 cents. They only have to pay out 45 cents in terms of a dividend and the remainder they can actually keep to grow the business. So they're still in compliance. And you'll see a lot of REITs that some of them do that, uh, but other REITs want to pay you know, more closer towards that um, uh, higher end of the cash flows as well. And that's fine as long as they have enough to grow in other means, make sure that they are not, uh, using very expensive equity, or for them, it would be using the equity that's cheap. So if the stock price is suppressed, you don't want them to be using that because then they're diluting you more and more to get the same amount of properties. So let's say a, if a stock is yielding like 10%, we'll think about it, that if the average cap rate in the United States is seven around there, and the uh, cost of the equity is 10%, that's not a good deal. You don't want them to be issuing shares, but maybe they that could be a tricky situation for REIT because maybe they, the debt side is also not that good because oftentimes debt and, and the equity stock can be uh, heavily correlated. And then you can see here, be an entity that is taxable as a corporation because that's what REITs are. REITs are a corporation, be managed by board of direction, this is standard, and then have at least 100 shareholders after its first year of existence. And that's to kind of broaden the control. And then the next one is to solidify that have no more than 50% of its shares held by five or fewer individuals. Again, that's to diversify or disperse the control. So no one person has a lot of control because the point of a REIT is kind of like a uh, collective ownership of many individual investors. Um, and again, it was designed for um, the, uh, the retail investor to have exposure to large real estate projects. So with that, that's kind of covering a lot of the structural stuff about REITs the benefits of REITs, the tax implications of REITs, not on an individual basis to yourself. Again, consult a licensed tax professional for your own individual tax circumstance, but what that would mean for me personally and how I handle it in my own portfolio. Um, I, I did go over a little bit of realty income. We might make a video separately about a deep dive in realty income, but that was just like a little sneak peek to use as an example for REITs. I believe REITs are a wonderful asset class if used properly. And depending on what an investor looks for or desires from an investment, REITs can serve that purpose. One last closing thought, you out there, if you can even think of a property type, there exists a REIT for that. I have seen REITs do that do anything. I've seen REITs that own billboards, you know, uh, mobile home parks, cell towers, hotels, anything you can think of, there is a REIT for it. And that's another thing that's really impressive about that whole asset class or industry. And again, it allows you to have real estate exposure with the liquidity of a stock. So that's a, you know, a good and a bad because one of some real estate investors, if you're watching out there, you're probably saying, well, one of the benefits of real estate oftentimes is that slower move to making decisions. And that can sometimes be a benefit. And like some might say, the coffee can approach to stock investing. Well, it's easier to do that with REITs, be, uh, sorry, with real estate, because the process to sell a real estate, maybe not now in this market, but normally it, it's, uh, it's longer than a, than a stock. A stock is very instant. So tomorrow uh, or any day that the stock market is open, I can quickly sell in my entire portfolio pretty quickly. And if it's a read, I can do that. But if it's real estate, I would maybe take like a month or a week. I don't know in this market, but again, those are some of the uh, benefits, I guess. So with that, guys, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment below. If you like the content and you thought this was informative, please feel free to share a like. 
Um, and also share this video with your friends, you know, uh, take advantage that our account is still kind of small. So we try to respond to almost every comment that comes in. Uh, if the if the comment is a very deep question, we might have to make a new video about it. But most of the time, when I'm, um, when I'm not working, I try my best to get in there and just answer some uh, questions any way I can. All right, thanks, guys, and have a good one.